With 7 billion humans and counting living on this organic spaceship called Earth, it's no surprise we can't agree on a lot of things. Different parts of the world have views they consider to be standard, but these views come into conflict when compared. But hey, that's alright, because when it comes to progress in the sciences, we're masters. For example, during the 1800s, there was a scientific boom where scientists discovered all sorts of things about physics, technology, geology, biology, and many more. And in only 13 years, 1990 to 2003, the Human Genome Project unlocked human DNA and figured out how cells synthesize it and in what order its base pairs come in. But in this, the first decades of the 21st century, we figured out how to change the genetic makeup of plants by inserting other genes into them so they work better for us. How wild is that? Unfortunately, the idea of GMOs, or genetically modified organisms, get a lot of hate from a lot of people. But why is that exactly? Is genetic modification ethically wrong? Are they harmful to humans and the rest of the environment? That's what we're going to find out on this episode of Stuff You've Probably Wondered. Let's start, before we get into the controversy of GMOs, by looking at the facts of what they are and how they work. In order to actually consider an organism to be genetically modified, scientists must take an unrelated gene from an outside organism and put it in another. This can be accomplished by inserting foreign DNA into a cell's nucleus, or changing a cell's makeup with the use of a benign virus. The origin of these genes can come from all sorts of places, from insects to plants to animals, but usually they come from viruses and bacteria. The first GMOs were made during the early 1970s, but only came into regular use in the following decades. Like all early technologies, their existence didn't exactly fall under any standardized laws, so researchers of all kinds became more and more ambitious with genetic engineering. However, the most successful of all GMs were with plants. It's easy to study how genes work and change with plants, just ask Gregor Mendel who discovered the dang things, because they can create multiple generations over a short period of time. And so, before you could say deoxyribonucleic acid, farmers were agreeing to try out GM crops. Now, it's worth noting that GM crops aren't used for health or nutrition purposes. This is almost never the case. Instead, the genes crops receive are natural pesticides from other organisms, or, as we'll see in a moment, used to make the production of other things easier. When GMOs were noticed by the world stage in 1990s, Europe especially looked at the Americans working with them and were like, Seriously, you guys? You're tossing genes from other stuff into your plants? There's no way that's a good idea. And so, Europe bans almost every use of GMOs in their crops and imports. All of them, that is, except for two. And this is a great way for us to look at what specific GMOs do. First is the MON810 maze created by Monsanto, that company from Missouri that created Roundup and everybody hates. MON810 is a breed of corn that has the gene of the cauliflower mosaic virus, which when consumed by butterflies, moths, and the European corn borer will kill them, but no other type of insect. This is extremely helpful for corn farmers because corn is one of the most widely grown and consumed crops in the US, and pesticides which would normally be used to kill bugs can sometimes have pretty bad side effects for humans. The other generally accepted GM crop is the Amphlora potato created by BASF, a chemical company from Germany. This potato, like basically everything in Germany, was made to be overly efficient. Most potatoes produce two molecules, amylose and amylopectin. Amylopectin is super good at holding together atomically and can be used to make paper, while amylose is a starch that degrades organic material. So the amphlora potato has the amylose producing gene turned off, and these little spuds can be used to make some sweet organic paper that doesn't require an expensive amylose removal procedure. So that covers what GMOs are, so let's talk about what they're good for. Going back to what I mentioned before, GMOs are for economic and efficiency purposes, not health and nutrition. That being said, researchers say that although there are no health benefits to having an ear of corn that can kill bugs with its flesh, there are no health risks either. But these GMOs have made some pretty vast claims to fame with their economic capability. According to economic specialist David Zilberman, GM crops have lowered the price of food overall, increased its output so it's more available to places where food is scarce, and decreased the use of pesticides. Also, in the grand scheme of things, only about a tenth of the world's food is genetically modified. All of this sounds great, so you have to wonder, why are people so adamant about banning it? The best answer is probably fear over what GMOs mean. The idea of implanting genes into other things just sounds unnatural, and so as a result, people are skeptical about its benefits and afraid they'll produce inverse health effects when eaten. It doesn't help that when GMOs first came on the scene in the 90s, all sorts of companies like Greenpeace and public figures like Ralph Nader and Prince Charles spoke out against them. Who could blame them, though? The idea of genetic modification is invariably tied with business, and is thus seen as more of a political view, not a scientific one. So with all that said, let's look at some facts as collected by the well-regarded science magazine, Scientific American. The biggest thing about genetic modification is that it happens a lot. Viruses are basically just genetic material coated in protein, and these little guys just love to plant their DNA into whatever they can find. 
With plant diseases, viruses will combine their genes with a crop whether we liked it to or not, and plants have had to fight them and grow immunities over time in order to continue to live, just as humans have done with herd immunity and vaccines. And speaking of humans, we have been genetically modifying crops for more than just a few decades. Selective breeding is a practice that allows farmers to change generations of crops in order to make them more profitable and nutritious for the consumer. For example, here is a picture of a watermelon now, and here is a picture of a watermelon from about 400 years ago. It's pretty obvious which one you'd rather devour at a picnic. Truth is, selective breeding is the best way for us to make food better for us, and in some cases to save them. To explain this, we'll need to look at the most popular fruit of all time, the banana. Bananas are the world's favorite. In 2011, there were an astounding 139.2 million tons of them produced, an amount not even the proud apple or orange can touch, at 80 million and 96 million respectively. However, did you know that every banana you or anyone else has ever eaten is the same? That's because every banana is a clone of the singular breed of banana, the Cavendish. Aside from a few exotic places where you can find bananas that taste like vanilla ice cream and so many others, the Cavendish is the only banana left out of the original over 1,000 species. The reason? A deadly fungus called Panama disease wiped out nearly every banana in the mid-1900s, including the Cavendish's processor, the Gross Michael, which is still the flavor of any banana-flavored candy you may have eaten. Panama disease hasn't killed off the Cavendish because its native region is in South America where the fungus has yet to reach, and so this singular banana has been cloned and selectively bred to keep it safe. It's only a matter of time though until the disease mutates and takes down our most beloved fruit. So now let's return to the topic of GMOs. If we were able to implant a gene in the Cavendish banana, it would still be the same banana, but it would have an herbicide lurking in it that Panama disease could never touch. Scientists who create GMOs of any kind are able to track where the genes go in implanted crops and how they act, according to the University of California biologist Robert Golding. In addition, there has never been a single verified case of illnesses attributed to eating GM crops as of yet. There have been plenty of assumed cases, of course, where a population eating some crop coming from a singular place all got sick, but oftentimes these cases come from crops that don't even have GMOs in them. The usual suspect of such sickness is usually due to shady characters like E. coli, a bacterium that has deadly effects on animals if eaten. If you still aren't convinced, the European Commission, basically the task force of the European Union, funded a huge number of research projects, a whole 130 of them, that were carried out by over 500 independent teams, and exactly none of them found any risks from eating a GM crop, according to Scientific American. Even the US Food and Drug Administration, which is notorious for being lax on allowing certain drugs to hit the market, did their own tests on GMOs and also found no threats. Now all this research is great on paper, but let's be clear that GMOs are still a very new technology. Even with all of these benefits and lack of any dangers, there still could be some lurking about that we haven't come across. As Robert Goldberg attested earlier, scientists track the genes they implant so they make sure they perform as they're meant to. But sometimes this practice isn't very successful. There's always the chance of the best laid plans of mice and men going awry, and so several problems could occur. Because evolution is happening all the time, it's very probable that the genes scientists use in GM crops could change over time and cause them to behave in ways we didn't mean them to. On the flip side, weeds and pests could learn to gain immunity to these genes that have been killing them off in the same way they overcome pesticides and herbicides. Also, there is the risk of tampering with ecosystems. If too many insects are killed by these natural pesticides or a few ears of corn drop into a nearby stream for an, any bug at all to munch on and die from, the ecosystem they occupy could be messed up on a butterfly effect at scale. Finally, because GMOs are so new, there could be any number of risks we haven't seen yet, subtle, long-term, or otherwise. So what is the best way to handle these issues? Well, the easiest things include keeping up safety testing on GM crops, writing new laws on how best to handle and develop crops, and become more strict with our policies on creating GMOs so that scientists don't just make a slew of untested ones and release them under the world. It's likely that in this scenario, GM crops would come onto the scene a lot slower with more muttering from those who only want scientific progress, financial gain, or both. The good news is that with this strictness will come GMOs that work better and have more use for us than ones that we have today. So are GMOs harmful? According to the current research, the answer is basically no. But that doesn't mean I want to advocate them or say you should put down that organically made, locally grown, hyper-vegan burger in place of an ear of corn that kills moths. Your choices in food are entirely your own, and staying away from certain things to promote a healthy lifestyle or being against animal cruelty is something that individuals decide, not some random guy with a whiteboard on the internet. When it comes to scientific progress, we're always looking for ways to make difficult things we did in the past easier. 
Maybe the human race isn't ethically ready for us to genetically change food on a grand scale, but it's these small changes, the prototypes of what will someday become standard in the world, that will make the future brighter than the past. Thanks for watching, and as always, if you have any questions you want me to answer, or have an original song you want me to put in the background of a future video, leave it in the comments or email me at stuffyouprobablywondered at gmail.com. Also in the comments, share your thoughts on GMOs. Do you think they're a good idea to use in the global market? How do you think we'll change the policies on GM crops in order to make them better? Either way, I'll see you next time on Stuff You Probably Wondered.